Ardha Muni said, You, my dear Lord, who are always increasing the honor of your devotees, have descended in my home just to fulfill your word and disseminate the process of real knowledge. Report by Srila Prabhupada. When the Lord appeared before Kardama Muni after his mature yoga practice, he promised he would become Kardama's uh, son. He descended as the son of Kardama Muni in order to fulfill that promise. Another purpose of his appearance is Chakirshur Bhagavan Gyanam to distribute knowledge. Therefore, he is called Bhaktanam Manavardhanaha, he who increases the honor of his devotees. By distributing Sankhya, he would increase the honor of the devotees. Therefore, Sankhya philosophy is not dry mental speculation. Sankhya philosophy means devotional service. How could the honor of the devotees be increased unless Sankhya were meant for devotional service? Devotees are not interested in speculative knowledge. Therefore, the Sankhya enunciated by Kapila Muni is meant to establish one firmly in devotional service. Real knowledge and real liberation is to surrender under the Supreme Personality of Godhead and engage in devotional service. So, here again, Srila Prabhupada refers to the Sankhya philosophy and he points out that by presenting this Sankhya philosophy, Kardama Muni will increase the honor of the devotees uh, because this Sankhya philosophy is related to devotional service. So, uh, the way in which Sankhya philosophy is related to devotional service is that it explains the uh, relationship between the individual conscious beings, the material energy, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, it's important to uh, understand that uh, relationship initially uh, so that uh, we will be able to act in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and understand our actual constitutional position. So, in the Sankhya philosophy, there are various categories of energy that are described. It deals primarily with the material energy and it also describes the process of creation. Uh, so, the uh, Sankhya philosophy describes how, starting with Pradhan, which is then uh, set into motion by the glance of Mahavishnu, different transformations are produced. And finally, the uh, gross and subtle material elements are uh, generated. So, in particular, the uh, subtle elements of mind, intelligence, and false ego are uh, generated. And these elements, of course, are important. Uh, the situation of the conscious living being in the material world is that the living being or spirit soul is embedded or encased in a subtle body made of mind, intelligence, and false ego. And that, in turn, can reside within different gross bodies made of earth, air, fire, water, and ether. So this is, of course, of fundamental importance. Uh, one feature of this philosophy is that it uh, provides the basis for understanding the transmigration of the soul. Uh, what happens is that the soul becomes linked up with the subtle body the subtle body is uh, in existence during the entire period in which the soul is conditioned. So the subtle body doesn't die until the soul actually becomes liberated. But it undergoes different transformations. It's like reprogramming a computer. You can have a computer uh, and you can comp completely change the software in that computer. And when you do that, the computer behaves in a completely different way. So similarly, the subtle body continues to exist throughout the uh, period of the soul's conditional existence, but it's continually being reprogrammed based on the activities of the soul. And this programming determines the uh, well mental uh, and physical situation of the, the spirit soul. So one feature then is that 
there's this element called mind. Now we find, though, that in modern society, uh, the um, intellectual elite of modern society doesn't accept any of these things. But of course, we don't want things to remain that way. Uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement is supposed to spread everywhere and become extremely prominent uh, in this particular portion of the Kali Yuga. I mentioned the other day that uh, this devotee Atmatattva came across a reference in uh, Shastra to this 10,000 year period of Lord Chaitanya. You'll find it in the Brahma Vivarta Purana. So, for a period of 10,000 years, uh, devotional service to Krishna uh, following Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement will become very prominent. But it's not prominent yet. So therefore, uh, we're in the initial phase, actually, of a revolution of consciousness in which uh, current ways of thinking are going to radically change. So the changes that are required will be quite radical. I brought some material here. Let's see, here's the latest Discover magazine. This tells you what to believe about science. Uh, so this is significant. The last time I gave class, I uh, brought up the point that we have a great deal of faith in science. And uh, certainly the scientists I mean, the point was raised in that uh, class that the scientists are great experts in their field. Uh, they've devoted years of study to becoming expert. And ideas within the scientific community are rigorously scrutinized by scientists. And every idea is challenged and given a very uh, severe examination. So that surely an idea can only be accepted if, in fact, it uh, passes this rigorous scrutiny. So what do scientists say about this mind business anyway? Well, you'll find that there are scientists who agree that consciousness is quite mysterious. Here we've got three interviews. In fact, this Discover magazine has on the cover 10 Great Unanswered Questions of Science. So here the uh, 10 questions are listed, and one of them is, what is consciousness? So consciousness is a great unanswered question of science. However, uh, does that mean that there's some kind of soul which might transmigrate? Can a scientist of today uh, admit such a possibility in the scientific community? Um, well, no. It doesn't work that way. For example, in this discussion, there's a fellow named Koch very prestigious scientist who is talking about the mysteries of consciousness and he's talking about the idea of an observer in the brain that, you know, sees what's going on in there because you have sense data transmitted into the brain by nerve impulses and then finally uh, there's consciousness of what is being sensed. So that would suggest that there's an observer that senses what's going on in the brain. So he says, of course there's a problem. There's a you, that is, there's an observer. And there's no such observer in the brain. We don't want to go back to the notion of a homunculus looking at this. And then the Discover interviewer says, that would be going back to the idea of the little man in the brain. And Koch replies, exactly. So, we don't want to do that. Of course, what is this little man in the brain? Uh, this homunculus. Well, that would have to be the soul. Uh, that's what they're referring to. Some non-physical uh, observer, or even a physical thing that could be obser an observer. It's more or less recognized, though, that a physical thing cannot be an observer because a physical thing is a machine made up of little parts. And as soon as you analyze it, you see the need for an observer of that machine. So they're presented with a problem. However, uh, they have a basic uh, solution to this, and that is to get down to the neurons in the brain. Because wherever consciousness may be, that's where it will be, the neurons of the brain. And then here we have a fellow named Terry Winograd, who's famous in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, so 
he's a fellow who, in the early days, um, created a little program that could talk and uh, execute verbal commands. And that was quite an accomplishment. He became quite famous for that. However, it couldn't talk the way we can. And he finally came to the conclusion that you'll never be able to program a computer that can really think the way a human being does. Can't do it. So the Discover interviewer asked, her, well, asked him, well, do you think then that you know, there could be something to consciousness that is non-physical and, and beyond the, the brain. And he emphasized that, well, no, he didn't think that at all. Uh, it's that computers won't be conscious, but that doesn't mean that brains aren't. After all, brains are different from computers. They're not made of silicon chips, you know. Uh, and he says, I'm ultimately a materialist. So I would say, of course, if you really could duplicate it, that's the brain, piece by piece, it would all be the same pieces. Uh, there's no ethereal soul that makes me have consciousness. It is in the physical properties of my brain and my nervous system. So, uh, in case there's any question about the possibility of any non-physical uh, mind or soul or ethereal soul, as he puts it, no, uh, that's not acceptable. Sorry. Scientists do not accept such a thing. What to speak of all the other things we might like to, to bring to their attention. So, uh, I uh, wanted to comment a little bit about the idea that these scientists really are so worthy of our respect and faith. Um, actually, they're not. Of course, Srila Prabhupada continually blasted the scientists. Uh, this folio program is interesting to use. You can put in words and strings of words and find out everything Srila Prabhupada said using those words. Uh, and if you put in scientist or scientists, uh, you'll get hundreds of, of references, uh, more than you can possibly look up. So you can do interesting things like, uh, one that I checked was uh, uh, challenge scientists 10. When you put a 10 after it, it means that it'll give you all uh, sections where Srila Prabhupada used the word challenge and the word scientist within ten words of each other. I just picked ten as an arbitrary figure. So, uh, it came out, that was reasonably small, it came out to about 83 uh, cases. Uh, if, you, if you increase it to within 20 words of one another, you'll get even more. And it was interesting, he was saying that we should challenge these rascal scientists. Another one you can do is look up rascal scientists. <laughs> you get even more cases there. Uh, too many to print out. I mean, you may as well print out a, a book or something. So, uh, Shiva Prabhupada had a rather radical view of these, these scientists. And actually, it's a fact that if Krishna consciousness is to be regarded as, as at all true or at all believable, then the scientists have to be wholesale mistaken. And that was a thing that Srila Prabhupada said. He said that to me in particular uh, three times in a row on one occasion, so I sort of remembered it. Uh, so, they have to be wholesale mistaken. Now, how is that possible? How could it be? Uh, because, after all, they are so rational and so learned, and they scrutinize one another's ideas, and... Uh, so on and so forth. So how is it possible? Well, I thought I'd speak a little bit about uh, paradigm shifts. This is uh, an interesting thing. It seems that a, a paradigm shift has occurred in the use of the concept of paradigm shifts. And this was proven by the recent GBC meeting in Atlanta. Uh, because there, I believe, a, a video was shown about paradigm shifts. Uh, and this was being applied in the field of business. And this is interesting because it started out in the field of philosophy of science. So, about 30 years ago, I guess, this book came out. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. This is the uh, where paradigm shifts were first introduced. And uh, it's somewhat of a dense academic book. And he's talking about uh, ways of seeing things in science. So a clever fellow 
had a new way of seeing things, and he realized that para the idea of paradigm shifts could be used to make money for him uh, by going and giving speeches to uh, corporate CEOs and people like that. And he's been going around doing that quite successfully, as far as I can see. So uh, that's actually in itself an example of a paradigm shift, because uh, I myself had always thought of paradigm shifts in terms of the scientific and academic uh, study of theories and how they change. I never thought of uh, using this as a way of getting money from uh, businesses. But this fellow saw it. And that illustrates what a paradigm is. He points out in his video that a paradigm is a way of seeing things which limits what you can see. It enables you to see certain things very well. But by enabling you to see certain things well, it limits what you can see so that other things beyond the boundary of the paradigm you cannot see at all. You're blind to them. So, uh, paradigms are very important, but at the same time they limit us. Now, uh, he gave the, a nice example there of the uh, what happened to Swiss watches. This was a pretty good one. It seems that uh, a few years back in the 1960s, Switzerland was in the position of world dominance in the watch industry. Uh, they had some very large share of the market in uh, wristwatches. So it seems that in Switzerland, uh, somebody invented a new kind of watch. Uh, a fellow working for one of the main Swiss watch companies, in fact, or a team of people, they invented the quartz uh, crystal watch with the electronics and the liquid uh, crystal display like this. So. This was this watch was uh, they tried to promote this uh, among the Swiss watchmakers and it was totally rejected. The watchmaking experts said, you know, who needs this? Uh, this is useless. That's not how you make a watch. We know about watches. We're the experts. So uh, they put it on display. Apparently, this was regarded as being so insignificant that nobody even bothered to patent it. And it was put on display at one trade show, and some Japanese fellows walked by. <laughs> and the rest is the rest is history. <laughs> Within a couple of years, the Japanese flooded the world with cheap watches built on this principle, and the, the Swiss share of the market in watches went down to 10% of the market from something like 80% previously, and hundreds of thousands. Well, at least 80,000 or so, I think, uh, Swiss watch workers were laid off. And uh, so anyway, it shows what can happen when a paradigm shifts. So uh, this video made interesting points in about uh, paradigm shifts. But the original area where this was applied was to scientific theories. Scientists also have paradigms. These are ways of seeing things again, which limit what you can see so that certain things just aren't visible to you. And uh, it's recognized widely that scientists are very good at seeing if something fits the accepted paradigm and of recognizing things that do fit the accepted paradigm. And when they're busy scrutinizing one another's ideas very intensely, that's what they're doing. They're seeing whether or not the ideas that are being brought up fit the existing paradigm. And if they do, then they become acceptable. And if they don't, then the scientists reject those ideas. But what about ideas outside the paradigm? Actually, this is related to the whole idea of pattern recognition. How are you able to see something like uh, an apple? You know, the moment we look at an apple, immediately we know what that is. That's an apple. Uh, the brain somehow, sticking to the standard accepted paradigm, is wired so that when an apple comes in front of your eye, immediately bells go off in there or something uh, because some recognition mechanism is programmed to recognize apples. But there may be some other thing that it can't recognize at all. So if you put that in front of your eyes, nothing happens. You don't even notice it. Well, the same thing occurs on a more abstract level with theories. So uh, what Kuhn was describing uh, was the process whereby paradigms change. And it's very interesting to see how that happens, because they do change. 
Uh, to give you an example, uh, there's the theory of continental drift. The prevailing idea in geology today is that continents move around. Uh, Europe and the United States used to be right together, and there was no Atlantic Ocean. And then a big crack appeared, and they separated apart, and gradually the Atlantic Ocean formed. This is now accepted. Well, this was proposed by a man named Wegener back in about 1912, and the idea was totally rejected for years, until finally, in about the mid-1960s, a revolution occurred in scientific thinking. And after that revolution, continental drift was the established accepted view, in that now, if you don't believe in continental drift, you're uh, considered to be uh, unscientific. So this is what happens in science. Uh, you have a paradigm. The previous paradigm was, of course, that continents don't drift. They're rigidly, you know, part of the solid stone floor of the, the Earth, uh, the ocean floor. So how could they drift around? So uh, that was the old paradigm. Uh, what happens when a paradigm shifts is that, first of all, anomalies have to accumulate. Uh, if everything fits the accepted paradigm, then people are never going to change it. So, uh, what happens is gradually anomalies accumulate, and initially the anomalies are rejected. And typically, if somebody wants to insist too much about the anomalies in the phase when they're being rejected, the person gets rejected along with the anomalies. In fact, the person becomes an anomaly. And this is done using the traditional method known as ridicule, uh, which is a very effective scientific tool. Uh, by ridicule, you can scare people away from an idea because no one wants to be ridiculed. So if you create an aura of ridicule around something, people will stay away from it like anything. Very few people will have anything to do with it. So that's what's going on in that quote that I had uh, a moment ago about the little man in the brain. You'll notice that it's, uh, what's being said there is, uh, or what's being done there is ridicule is being used. Sometimes it's even said the little green man in the brain. <laughs> now why green? Well, you know why. You know about little green men. So why in talking about the mind-body question would one refer to the idea of the soul as the concept of the little green man in the brain? Well, it's to make people laugh so that anyone who seriously talks about such an idea will be laughed at and therefore people won't talk about that idea. This is actually how it works. Uh, there's a uh, great defender of scientific truth named Martin Gardner who, by the way, is on the board of directors of PSYCOP. PSYCOP is the Committee for the Investigation no, Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. So, these people police the, uh, the scientific world to make sure that no paranormal claims are accepted. And one of his aphorisms uh, is that um, a, a horse laugh is worth a thousand syllogisms. Yeah, one horse laugh is worth, is worth a thousand syllogisms. So a syllogism is a logical step. Like, if A is true and A implies B, then B is true. So that's one step in logic. So he's saying that uh, if you have an argument that you make using 1,000 syllogisms, a single horse laugh is worth all of that argumentation. In fact, it's better. Because it's going to be hard to find somebody who's going to appreciate an argument with a 1,000 steps. But anybody knows what a horse laugh means. It means... Stay away from this or you'll be laughed at. Associating an idea with, you know, being weird, being disreputable, being zany, being kooky. Uh, just like uh, James Watson, he characterized his opponent, opponents as shits, kook, kooks, and incompetence. Uh, this is the scientific world. <laughs> but this is how it actually works. It's quite important. So... Uh, what happens in science is that initially the anomalies are scorned and rejected. Uh, Wegener was scorned and rejected throughout his lifetime. And uh, 
But finally, if enough anomalies accumulate, there will be uh, increasing discomfort among the, the scientists. And finally, there will be a revolution. Suddenly, the old fabric will just rip. It's just like you're wearing the same dhoti day after day and it, it works and then one day you put it on and the thing rips down the middle and that's it. So, <laughs> this is a homely example. So anyway, uh, so finally there can be a revolution and one point this fellow made on that video that they showed the, the GDC uh, is that when the revolution occurs, when the new paradigm comes in, everybody starts at zero. It's a new ball game at that point. The very way people see things changes. Uh, Kuhn points out that um, it's difficult for people holding two different paradigms to even talk with one another because they see the world differently. Uh, so that can a and occur. Uh, actually, even things like the acceptance of Darwin's theory of evolution is an example of a paradigm shift. Now, one point that the fellow made was that paradigm shifts are initiated by outsiders. It's very rare indeed, in fact, I hardly know of any examples, in which a major paradigm shift is initiated or set off by somebody within an established field. The reason is that within an established field, everything is regimented. Uh, your colleagues immediately will jump on you if you begin to deviate. So, in that setting, it's very difficult to start a new paradigm. So to introduce the, uh, the new kind of watch in Switzerland was extremely difficult. In fact, it wasn't possible there. An outsider had to do it, namely the Japanese. So the same thing happens in science. Paradigm shifts are brought about by outsiders. Now Darwin, by the way, was an outsider. Uh, he, in fact, was a recluse, practically. He was independently wealthy because his father was a very wealthy physician. Uh, he never had to work a day in his life, and he lived in a comfortable Victorian mansion out in the countryside in East Anglia somewhere, and uh, just worked on his, his researches. So, uh, another aspect is that for a paradigm shift to occur, a, a lot of anomalous material has to accumulate. In fact, what Darwin did was he spent 20 years building up his case. Uh, he read the, he wrote the most, he finally wrote the most successful unwritten, unread book in history, practically. Because whoever reads Darwin's Origin of Species, just a few people have ever read the thing. It's practically unreadable. It's packed with lots of facts. And a few people did read it, and they, uh, realized that, uh oh, it's time for the paradigm to shift. Uh, basically, the balance, the total mass of material, at that point shifted. There was a revolution in thought, and within, let's say, 30 years, uh, Darwinian evolution was the accepted way for uh, educated people to think about the origin of life. Yeah? I'm wondering if you're saying it was an accumulation of facts, sort of like a filter, that just so many anonymous built up, it just shifted. Yeah. I'm wondering if just accumulation of not only, you know, that's enough, or how much has been social factors and like, it, like I'm thinking of Christian consciousness and art as being shifting um, as far as becoming a, a worldview except of the idea of being soul and paranormal and things. Does it, how much, if you look back at history, uh, when there's been the shift in the worldview, the general public worldview, how much of it is just fact? How much of it is social circumstances? Well, social circumstances refers to how people are seeing things. Uh, and that's related to the accumulation of new ideas, which are the anomalies. You see, a fact is an idea. Uh, one may think that a fact is one thing. That's hard, solid evidence. And an idea is a sort of nebulous uh, thing in the mind. Actually, a fact is an idea. Because um, what is a fact anyway? It's just an opinion that somebody expresses. I may say it's a fact that uh, the bones of Lucy were dug up in Ethiopia. But well, all I'm doing is giving you another idea. Uh, if you accept it, then it's a fact. If you reject it, then it's some crazy idea. So fact is just another kind of idea. But as ideas accumulate, uh, people become aware of them. 
And at some point, there's a critical mass. So it does involve, it is social. The process of the paradigm shift is a social process. But it's a process involving ideas, how people think about things. Uh, in the case of Darwin, uh, so many different ideas. The idea that the world works mechanically, that had to seep into people's thinking. Uh, initially, that was very foreign to Western thinking. Uh, Newton triggered off a big paradigm shift in that area, and he was back in about 1650. Darwin's revolution occurred about 1850. So the mechanical idea of things began to seep in. Uh, old ideas such as the existence of angels as something real uh, gradually were fading away. Um, what's his name? Boyle, the inventor of Boyle's Law, literally believed in the reality of angels. And that was part of his traditional belief system. He wasn't a radical. But in his day, such things were still believable. So gradually those were going out and the mechanical concept was coming in. Fossils were being studied. Dinosaurs were being excavated. And big exhi public exhibitions of dinosaurs were being created. Uh, just before Darwin's time, in the Crystal Palace in, in, uh, near London, uh, big iguanodon sculptures were being created and the public was touring through. And the concept came that the world used to be different from what we think it is now. There were these monstrous creatures and so on. So all these things begin to percolate into people's thinking. And finally, it seems you get a critical mass where there are enough uh, anomalous ideas that didn't fit into the old way of thinking that the old way finally breaks. And then you still need, though, somebody to work hard to introduce the new theory. It's not that it's just going to happen automatically, but you have somebody like Darwin who did research for years and years, really working to make his case. And then you have people like Thomas Huxley. Uh, Thomas Huxley, uh, instead of doing research for years and years, he was a very uh, great debater. He took Darwin's material and he went out and lectured everywhere and beat people in debates. The famous one was when he beat Soapy Sam Wilberforce, uh, one, a big Anglican bishop, uh, in a public debate uh, and made a fool of the man. So uh, at that point, the, the uh, balance shifted. So, and the new paradigm became established. Even so, there was great resistance. There was a period of controversy. Darwin didn't publish his work for 20 years because he was afraid of that controversy. He was afraid of what they would do to him, uh, call him all kinds of bad names and just make life hell for him. Uh, so he finally only published when uh, Alfred Russell Wallace came up with the theory at the same time that he did. And he realized that if he was going to established priority. He had to publish right away, so he rushed into print at that point. So that's another factor. There's a period of controversy. The pioneers are going to be called bad names. This is the thing that has to be recognized. If you want to be the pioneer in a paradigm shift, uh, the point man on the leading edge, you're going to get a lot of flat. The people who follow afterwards will be in a much more comfortable position. It's just like the Marines going in to the uh, enemy lines. The first guys really get shot at quite a lot. So uh, this is the, the nature of the paradigm shifts. So the same thing applies uh, with us, which is, of course, why I brought up this, this whole thing, because we want to bring about a major radical paradigm shift. And so that means in every way, we are fundamentally challenging how people think. And Srila Prabhupada laid the groundwork for this by pointing out that the accepted scientists are wholesale mistaken. They're really off. And that means a lot of anomalies have to accumulate. And uh, they have to be brought together and explained and broadcast into people's consciousness on a massive scale. So that's one of the things that we have to, to do. Uh, we have to recognize that a radical position is required. And we have to be prepared to defend a radical position. And that means also we have to be prepared for all the ridicule and abuse that initially uh, comes with that, primarily with the material energy. And it also describes the process of creation. Uh, so the... Uh, 
Sankhya philosophy describes how, starting with Pradhan, which has been uh, set into motion by the glance of Mahavishnu, different transformations are produced. And finally, the uh, gross and subtle material elements are uh, generated. So, in particular, the uh, subtle elements of mind, intelligence, and false ego are uh, generated. And these elements, of course, are important. Uh, the situation of the conscious living being in the material world is that the living being or spirit soul is embedded or encased in a subtle body made of mind, intelligence, and false ego. And that, in turn, can reside within different gross bodies made of earth, air, fire, water, and ether. So this is, of course, a fundamental importance. Uh, one feature of this philosophy is that it uh, provides the basis for understanding the transmigration of the soul. Uh, what happens is that the soul becomes linked up with the subtle body. The subtle body is uh, in existence during the entire period in which the soul is conditioned. So the subtle body doesn't die until the soul actually becomes liberated. But it undergoes different transformations. It's like reprogramming a computer. You can have a computer uh, and you can comp completely change the software in that computer. And when you do that, the computer behaves in a completely different way. So similarly, the subtle body continues to exist throughout the uh, period of the soul's conditional existence, but it's continually being reprogrammed based on the activities of the soul. And this programming determines the, uh, well, mental uh, and physical situation of the, the spirit soul. So, one feature then is that there's this element called mind. Now, we find, though, that in modern society, uh, the um, intellectual elite of modern society doesn't accept any of these things. But, of course, we don't want things to remain that way. Uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement is supposed to spread everywhere and become extremely prominent uh, in this particular portion of the Kali Yuga. I mentioned the other day that uh, this devotee Atmatatva came across. I uh, wanted to comment a little bit about the idea that these scientists really are so worthy of our respect and faith. Um, actually, they're not. Of course, Srila Prabhupada continually blasted the scientists. Uh, this folio program is interesting to use. You can put in words and strings of words and find out everything Srila Prabhupada said using those words. Uh, and if you put in scientist or scientists, uh, you'll get hundreds of, of references, uh, more than you can possibly look up. So you can do interesting things like, uh, one that I checked was uh, uh, Challenge Scientists 10. When you put a 10 after it, it means that it'll give you all uh, sections where Srila Prabhupada used the word challenge and the word scientists within 10 words of each other. I just picked 10 as an arbitrary figure. So uh, it came out, that was reasonably small, it came out to about 83 uh, cases. Uh, if, you, if you increase it to within 20 words of one another, you'll get even more. And it was interesting, he was saying that we should challenge these rascal scientists. Another one you can do is look up rascal scientists. <laughs> you get even more cases there. Uh, too many to print out. I mean, you may as well print out a, a book or something. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada had a rather radical view of these, these scientists. And actually, it's a fact that if Krishna consciousness is to be regarded as, as at all true or at all believable, then the scientists have to be wholesale mistaken. And that was a thing that Srila Prabhupada said. He said that to me in particular uh, three times in a row on one occasion, so I sort of remembered it. Uh, so, they have to be wholesale mistaken. Now, how is that possible? How could it be? 
uh, because after all they are so rational and so learned and they scrutinize one another's ideas and uh, so on and so forth. So how is it possible? Well, I thought I'd speak a little bit about uh, paradigm shifts. This is uh, an interesting thing. It seems that a, a paradigm shift has occurred in the use of the concept of paradigm shifts. And this was proven by the recent GBC meeting in Atlanta. Uh, because there, I believe, a, a video was shown about paradigm shifts. Uh, and this was being applied in the field of business. And this is interesting because it started out in the field of philosophy of science. So about 30 years ago, I guess, this book came out. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. That's a reference in uh, Shastra to this 10,000 year period of Lord Chaitanya. You'll find it in the Brahma Vivarta Purana. So for a period of 10,000 years, uh, devotional service to Krishna uh, following Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement will become very prominent. But it's not prominent yet. So therefore, uh, we're in the initial phase, actually, of a revolution of consciousness in which uh, current ways of thinking are going to radically change. So the changes that are required will be quite radical. I brought some material here. Let's see, here's the latest Discover magazine. This tells you what to believe about science. Uh, so this is significant. The last time I gave class, I uh, brought up the point that we have a great deal of faith in science. And uh, certainly the scientists, I mean, the point was raised in that uh, class that the scientists are great experts in their field. Uh, they've devoted years of study to becoming expert. And ideas within the scientific community are rigorously scrutinized by scientists. And every idea is challenged and given a very uh, severe examination so that surely an idea can only be accepted if in fact it uh, passes this rigorous scrutiny. So what do scientists say about this mind business anyway? Well, you'll find that there are scientists who agree that consciousness is quite mysterious. Here we've got three interviews. In fact, this Discover magazine has on the cover 10 great unanswered questions of science. So here the uh, ten questions are listed, and one of them is, what is consciousness? So consciousness is a great unanswered question of science. However, uh, does that mean that there's some kind of soul which might transmigrate? Can a scientist of today uh, admit such a possibility in the scientific community? Um, well, no. It doesn't work that way. For example, in this discussion, there's a fellow named Koch, very prestigious scientist, who is talking about the mysteries of consciousness. And he's talking about the idea of an observer in the brain that, you know, sees what's going on in there. Because you have sense data transmitted into the brain by nerve impulses. And then, finally, uh, there's consciousness of what is being sensed. So that would suggest that there's an observer that senses what's going on in the brain. Muni said, You, my dear Lord, who are always increasing the honor of your devotees, have descended in my home just to fulfill your word and disseminate the process of real knowledge. Report by Srila Prabhupada. When the Lord appeared before Kardama Muni after his mature yoga practice, he promised he would become Kardama's uh, son. He descended as the son of Kardama Muni in order to fulfill that promise. Another purpose of his appearance is Chakirshur Bhagavan Gyanam to distribute knowledge. Therefore, he is called Bhaktanam Manavardhanaha. 
he who increases the honor of his devotees. By distributing Sankhya, he would increase the honor of the devotees. Therefore, Sankhya philosophy is not dry mental speculation. Sankhya philosophy means devotional service. How could the honor of the devotees be increased unless Sankhya were meant for devotional service? Devotees are not interested in speculative knowledge. Therefore, the Sankhya enunciated by Kapila Muni is meant to establish one firmly in devotional service. Real knowledge and real liberation is to surrender under the Supreme Personality of Godhead and engage in devotional service. So, here again, Srila Prabhupada refers to the Sankhya philosophy and he points out that by presenting this Sankhya philosophy, Karma Muni will increase the honor of the devotees uh, because this Sankhya philosophy is related to devotional service so, uh, the way in which Sankhya philosophy is related to devotional service is that it explains the uh, relationship between the individual conscious beings, the material energy, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, it's important to uh, understand that uh, relationship initially uh, so that uh, we will be able to act in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and understand our actual constitutional position. So in the Sankhya philosophy, there are various categories of energy that are described. It deals, he says, of course there's a problem. There's a you, that is, there's an observer. And there's no such observer in the brain. We don't want to go back to the notion of a homunculus looking at this. And then the discover interviewer says, that would be going back to the idea of the little man in the brain. And Koch replies, exactly. So, we don't want to do that. Of course, what is this little man in the brain, uh, this homunculus? Well, that would have to be the soul. Uh, that's what they're referring to. Some non-physical uh, observer, or even a physical thing that could be obser an observer. It's more or less recognized, though, that a physical thing cannot be an observer because a physical thing is a machine made up of little parts. And as soon as you analyze it, you see the need for an observer of that machine. So they're presented with a problem. However, uh, they have a basic uh, solution to this, and that is to get down to the neurons in the brain. Because wherever consciousness may be, that's where it will be, the neurons of the brain. And then here we have a fellow named Terry Winograd, who's famous in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, so he's a fellow who, in the early days, um, created a little program that could talk and uh, execute verbal commands. And that was quite an accomplishment. He became quite famous for that. However, it couldn't talk the way we can. And he finally came to the conclusion that you'll never be able to program a computer that can really think the way a human being does. Can't do it. So the Discover interviewer asked, her, well, asked him, well, do you think then that, you know, there could be something to consciousness that is non-physical and beyond the, the brain? And he emphasized that, well, no, he didn't think that at all. Uh, it's that computers won't be conscious, but that doesn't mean that brains aren't. After all, brains are different from computers. They're not made of silicon chips, you know. Uh, and he says, I'm ultimately a materialist. So I would say, of course, if you really could duplicate it, that's the brain, piece by piece, it would all be the same pieces. Uh, there's no ethereal soul that makes me have consciousness. It is in the physical properties of my brain and my nervous system. So... Uh, in case there's any question about the possibility of any non-physical uh, mind or soul or ethereal soul, as he puts it, no, uh, that's not acceptable. Sorry. Scientists do not accept such a thing. What to speak of all the other things we might like to, to bring to their attention? So, uh, 